Good morning, everyone. I'm Morgan Donner, and I've gotten a few requests from people for more get ready with me type videos. And today is a lovely day for pictures. So I am excited to get dressed up in one of my 16th century Italian style dresses. And I thought you guys might enjoy watching. So first up, we have a camiseta or chemise if you're French or a shift. I love the 16th century Italian style shifts. They have this really beautiful pleating that's bound up with a nice narrow bit of trim. And it's just, it's very pretty, very fine and delicate. And that pleating is really nice. And then next up we have a bit of hosiery some socks for my feet. I actually have a video showing how to make this exact same pair, so check that out in the description box somewhere below. These are made with a really nice warm wool, which will make a big difference for our weather, as you'll see later today. And then to help keep the socks up, I have some green linen woven trim to act as essentially garters to help keep those socks up. Next up, for a little bit of extra warmth, since I am going to be going out into the cold, I have essentially ye olde underpants. This is one of the cool things that is kind of a benefit of doing Italian style clothing, is that there isn't a lot of documentation for under things in the 16th century, but Italy is one of the places that does have extant and uh, pictorial documented evidence of it, and mine are very, very plain in comparison to some of the illustrations and extant ones we have, but they'll still add just that little bit of extra warmth and coverage. And now to help cover up all this, I have a very, very modestly ruffled partlet. Partlets are really lovely as a way to keep the sun off of the exposed skin at the top of your shift uh, because the dress itself does not cover that area. It's also nice for the cold weather because that little extra layer of warmth is really nice. So the bit of skin right here will tend to become exposed as just the garments work themselves away from each other throughout the day and I'm not a fan. I don't like that. Looks weird. Feels weird. It's not great. So I like to toss a pin in the side here to keep it from working itself out. All right, and I am all nicely covered up. Uh, don't worry too much about the string. We're going to take care of that later. This this is a look. So now that we've got all of our various underpinnings on, it's time for the overdress itself. Da -da -da -da. This one is made of wool and is moderately heavy. Not in a oppressively I can't wear this heavy kind of way, just in a it's got some heft to it. Yeah, I don't understand how in historical dramas they always look very pretty and lovely as they're getting dressed and I look like a monster. Actually, you know, I take that back. I know how they do it. They have maids to help everybody get dressed. I don't. So don't mind me as I gracefully wiggle myself into everything. So you might notice that the sleeves are tied into place rather than being sewn. The advantage of that is that you can take them off completely if it's really hot or switch them out for when you just want different colored sleeves to go with a certain outfit. Get everything all neat and tidy. All right, so the dress is on. It's looking cute. I do still need to lace up this front opening, so after I do that, I'll show you a full look of the thing. So I like to end all of my knots with a slip knot. It involves twisting it, pulling it through the loop you just made, and sort of tightening it up against the point that I want it to be tightened. 
and then all of this excess just gets tucked into the bodice. Now that string that I mentioned earlier, we can go ahead and just untie that and then tuck it in. Getting these strings to be even definitely takes a little bit of zhuzhing as well. You want to aim for nice and parallel sides here. Keep on zhuzhing and adjusting to your heart's content until everything looks about where you want it to be. Good enough. So this dress and these kind of funny looking sleeves are actually based off of an illustration from the 16th century book by Cesare Vecellio, where he covers fashion from all over his world, essentially, including Italy. I particularly love the look of this peasant woman, and I actually have a whole blog post all about it, particularly her skirt. But this is the dress and sleeves that you see here. In this passage describing the illustration, he writes that they wore coral or silver beads around their necks as well as on their breast, as well as down the seams of their sleeves. So that is what my very silly, silly circles here, they are giant silver beads to match the approximate proportion and size of hers. All right, so I've gotten a really good head start on the dress, but this hair nonsense will have to be neatened up. So starting off, instead of a side part, we want to go with a center part. Next up, we're going to want to twist these bang area fringe. You can either twist quite literally like this, or what I often like to do is go for just a little bit more definition with that twist and do a sort of a, like a French braid, but there's only two strands, so I guess it's a French twist. So I go down until I have two pretty healthy braid sizes, and this last bit that's left over is gonna make up our third strand of a braid, and we just start a braiding. Braid all the way down to the tippy toes of your hair. All right, so I've got my pair of braids. If your braids are long enough, you can go around the back of your head and then across the top, which is very pretty and lovely. And you end up with that really nice, completely covered back. Or if your braids are a little bit on the shorter side, you might want to just go milkmaid style. You can also use a little bit of good old fake hair to help supplement as well, which I'm going to totally do today. So just toss it up around the back of your head. And then I'm just going to use a couple of these U-shaped pins to hold it in place. So next up, I'm going to use my own natural braids to help cover up and blend in with the fake one. I've got to say, this is kind of a cute look. If only I had oodles and oodles of hair to just make like a crown plus falling braids. Thank you. All right, so I got that all pinned in, and while it looks cute, mm, it's just a little bit too far forward, so let's adjust that back a little bit. It's very easy to have it kind of do a headband thing, way up here, kind of right at the very top of the head, but you really want to try and aim for almost back of head. Does that make sense? 
I'm going to try and get all of the ends and bits tucked in neatly and as semi-invisible as possible. All right, so we have our fake circle in place, and now we're gonna augment it with the real ones. I think that looks about right. It is very tempting to make it a little bit higher up. It has a kind of very pretty crown effect when you wear it a little bit more visible from the front. You can see here, you can't really see much of what's up top back here. It looks kind of more nice and pretty to the modern eye when you wear it a little bit more forward, but it seems like a lot of the illustrations show it a little bit further back. All right, so we are all pinned in place, and that is good, that should hold, but even better is to do some Italian 16th century hair taping, which is to take a tape, <laughs> a silk ribbon or what have you, and lace it around your braids, catching a little bit of scalp hair as you go to tape it to your hair. So to start off, we're going to take our tape, which is about 75 inches long, and we wanna make sure that we have enough for both sides and evenly do the whole thing. So the only way I get to make that happen is if I divide it in half to begin with. There we go. And then I hold on to one of the halves so that it can't get sucked in. Now that I've done that first round, I don't have to worry about it pulling out anymore and I can go ahead and do the second one. Okay, so this little piece up here can get tied into a pretty pretty bow. And if you have a little bit too much excess like we do here, I just like to tuck that underneath the braid a little bit. So here's the finished braid. Last but not least, we're gonna do some finishing touches. I have some coral beads for about my neck because I'm a very, very big fan of the coral bead look. It's very cute. And because I'm feeling uppity, I'm gonna wear my pearl earrings, even though I'm going for a very peasant look. Sometimes it's a pearly peasant, I don't know what to tell you. And then for my dress, I have a few more small accessories. I have a little pouch that I'm going to tie about my waist. And then I have this very, very pretty apron with some trim that is meant to be imitating the style of the hand embroidered late 16th century aprons. There's a couple of extant ones that are really, really beautiful. I don't have that kind of time. So mine is a, a trim that I found that I knew would be just perfect for it. All right, so next up, if I was feeling a little extra fancy, and this does seem to be pretty common for a lot of Cesare Vitellio's mentionings of 16th century women, both upper and lower class, is a veil of some kind. Whether that's ones that go over the face, and yes, there's lots of him mentioning that they are covering their face and peeking out from above their veil, <laughs> or you can pin it delicately about the back of your head. Which is definitely a very pretty look. I think I will go ahead and wear it today because it is very, very pretty, and I like that. So I like to just place it approximately where I want it. I like to put some of the length down the front so I can verify that it's somewhat even. Once I've found a good pair of anchor spots for my braid, I will just use those hairpins that I was using for the rest of this 
and very gently pierce through my fabric, attempting to do as little damage as possible to it because I do like it. So I have my two little pins here inserted into my fabric and we're just going to flip that back. I want to give it as ma maximum grabby power as possible. There we go. Okay. Alright, so we are all pinned in place. It may occasionally sort of blow in front of or behind the braid. Either way is just fine. So it's kind of interesting, the 16th century, how there's this sort of very slight gentle nod towards the idea that women are supposed to cover their hair. You see that a lot throughout the various medieval ages across Europe. Lots of covering of the hair. By the time you get to the 16th century, they're just sort of like, all right, we'll kind of cover our hair. Barely. All right, so I think it's about time for me to go out and about and have my adventures taking pictures. I will definitely share some of them in the video following this, and I hope you guys all have a wonderful, wonderful day.